It is January the 20th, 2023, and you're listening to Tips from the Top Floor, episode 928. Tips from the top, from the top floor, tips from the top, all right, from the top floor. Woo, hey, how's going? How's it going? How's going? How's, <laughs> how's everyone? What have you been up to? Let me know. Um, I'll let you know what I've been up to. I have been, well, I'm Chris and this is Tips from the Top Floor, the longest running photography podcast. And I've been up to, uh, let's see, TFOB, the future of photography, 245 is out. And uh, it's a different dynamic when you have other people <laughs> to bounce things off of. Um, and uh, that's an episode with Adrian and Jeremiah and myself, all three of us um, being there. And uh, Adrian talks about his first camera purchase of the year. Yes, the year is not that old and he already bought a camera. Um, and it's not a Q2, despite the title of that episode. Uh, we also have a conversation about historical photos and about gold plating photography on glass. It's, it's amazing. It's really amazing to see uh, the art that uh, Jeremiah is working on. He's, yeah, he's on a run. And uh, on a roll, not on a run, on a roll. <sighs> also an update on myself, uh, specifically my hearing loss from late last year, um, which was a bit of a scare for me. And uh, I'm happy to say that the majority of my hearing is now restored to the state that it was before, um, which doesn't mean the tinnitus is gone. <laughs> it's been with me for decades, but uh, the low frequency hole in the spectrum of my right ear, that's back back to where it used to be and that is good news anyway let's talk photography um lightroom here's a tool uh update that i came across a german startup neuropix says they have developed artificial intelligence based software that can learn from previously edited images and apply them to new photos at a blistering rate of up to 600 photos per minute that's uh yeah, that's me quoting Petapixel, by the way. And it's okay, this is an interesting use case of AI because um, you remember I've <laughs> written this ebook, uh, 1000 pictures in an hour. Um, this is 600 photos in a minute. And uh, so, what this thing does is it, um, it learns. Like you, you, up, you, you, you give it uh, information and it learns your style, your editing style. And then through i don't even know how exactly it works i think it's importing the settings back into lightroom it can give you uh, consistency in your photos that's what they claim i have not tried this but i've seen results and yeah they don't look that bad so so uh, it's a bit different from other tools because it doesn't edit your photos it gives you the lightroom slider settings so if you if you, if you use lightroom um that tool can uh, apply the settings in a way that is non-destructive the way Lightroom works so you can fix them you can change them and um, yeah it's they, they are a bit, a bit inconsistent in the, the actual speed they claim sometimes they say like 600 in a minute and then in other areas they say 1000 in five minutes doesn't really matter it's not that important but um, it, what's, in, what's interesting is that they give you the edits, but not uh, the finished photo. You can change the sliders wherever you want. Now, of course, I personally, I don't think this will be any good for me because of... Ah, it learns your style, right? Which implies that you do have one style, that you have that specific style and let's say you're a wedding photographer and you're known for your photos with the specific dreamy look or, um, or your food, food photographer and your food photos are always in a specific style. If that's your thing, if that's, if that's what you do when you uh, edit your photos and everything comes out very consistently at, in the same style, then yeah, I think that makes sense. Let it learn that style and have it get, have it, have it do the edits for you at least the basic set of edits and that'll probably save you some time if you are like a high volume uh, uh professional photographer who does nothing but 
but this um yeah i'm not again i'm not sure it will work for me because of if i look at my photos i there's there's a body of work that is very high contrast black and white and there's another body of work that is very low contrast color pastel tones and then there's another part of my work that is very um well they are there's different specific i'll probably call them islands of my work that are not that do not intersect that much and that might have to do with with the fact that i teach photography and that i have to be kind of okay in different styles but also it also speaks to the fact that i get bored <laughs> that i need uh to change it up every now and then so not for me but if again if you have that one specific style then uh go for it now what they also um what they promise is very similar to what uh, Imagen AI, I-M-A-G-E-N AI, uh, launched in last April. Um, I think Imagen gives you finished edited photos, like in TIFF format, I think. So um, th that's one of the differences. The other is that uh, Neuropix are cheaper. They charge less for a photo. Um, yeah. So if you are that kind of a photographer, yeah, go for it. Makes a lot of sense. Speaking of AI, <laughs> there are lawsuits against AI. Yes, that was to expect it. Um, there's one lawsuit um, that uh, goes specifically against Stability AI. That's the, the people who make Stable Diffusion, the image generator, and against DeviantArt and against MidJourney. DeviantArt photo sharing website but that also now has a has an image generator built in and mid journey is another image generator so they um yeah th there's a class action lawsuit against those um and uh the lawyer claims that's because these tools make collages of existing like remixing existing works and copyright infringement so on i'm not sure where this will go um i have my doubts there but uh it's i think it's noteworthy that they that this lawsuit ex lawsuit exists and um it's also noteworthy that it goes against those that are well that it doesn't go against companies like openai with dali or against google with their imogen project because well i i guess the open source um, side of things is a bit more vulnerable to to lawsuits so uh, let's see for that again from, from a legal point of view i'm not i'm not a legal expert but i think it will be difficult to make that case um and the second lawsuit is getty against stable diffusion so uh, getty is also uh beating the similar drum because they say um that stable diffusion has used getty images um, to train their AI, and that would be a uh, copyright infringement, which I honestly, I personally don't have that much sympathy for Getty. Um, but yeah, two lawsuits that I'm um, going to keep an eye on. And uh, it's always difficult for me to to sort this into, into well, or to find the bucket to sort that into. And uh, um xkcd if you have a nerd you know xkcd comic strips um xkcd has a very good uh example or a very good idea about um the questions that get asked about every new technology so i'm gonna just place that link in the show notes you can check that out for yourself it's kind of it's kind of fun now speaking of artificially generated things um something that we all photographers deal with is licensing of our pictures in one way or another if you just shoot for yourself no of course that's fine but if you the moment you want to use someone's photography or the moment you want to sell some photography you have to think about that now you you know about copyright which that's the legal concept that gives creators uh, exclusive rights over their original works and yes, it's handled slightly different in different parts of the world, but the general concept stands. So copyright has been around forever. 
Um, you've also probably heard of Creative Commons, which was started in oh, 2000, 2001, I guess. Um, and Creative Commons is, is, a, is a set of licenses that allow creators to share their works with others while still retaining some control over how those pictures are used. There's like a creative um, that the Creative Commons license, uh, Creative Commons license that is clearly non-commercial. There's one with a share alike clause where you have to share under the same license with a uh, attribution and so on. So ch check that out, Creative Commons. I'm pretty sure by this time everyone has heard of that. And they have been, the Creative Commons licenses have been pretty widely adopted by creators uh, who are looking to share their works while, while still maintaining some control over how the works are used. Um, but then, <laughs> just over the last years, AI and machine learning technologies have become more uh, prevalent and there's a growing need to ensure that they are kind of... Uh, being developed and used in a responsible and ethical manner. That's one of the big pieces of the discussion right now. And that's where rails come in. To me, this was a new term. I uh, just recently found out about it. Uh, rails are a new category of open source licenses um, that are specifically designed for AI and machine learning projects. Rails stands for Responsible AI License. That's an initiative that started in uh, 2019, so not too long ago. And um, th these rails or responsible AI licenses, they include clauses that address like ethical concerns around the, the use of AI, uh, which means things like ensuring that the AI is not used for harmful purposes or in ways that, that discriminate against certain groups of people. Um, Rails also require developers to provide detailed documentation about the AI system, uh, which would include how it works and what data it was trained on. And uh, it would uh, th those Rails would also um, allow third-party organizations to audit the AI system to ensure that it is being used responsibly. And the goal of a Rails is... is is to create a standard for responsible AI development and, and use that can be um, adopted by developers, by organizations, by governments. And uh, yeah, f here to, to foster like a more responsible and ethical use of AI and machine learning. Um, so there you have it, Rails, new category of open source licenses specifically designed for AI and there's different levels of those. There's um, there's rail categories. One is the rail M, as in rail for for models. So if you have a neural network model that you download that someone trained on something, um, that is uh, that would be under an, an an a rail M license and so on. There's these new terms to learn, but um, I will link to uh, a website about those licenses. And then there's also open rail, which is a specific type of rail license that is, a, is an open source license, which is designed to be more permissive um, than the other ones and would would use uh, would allow more flexibility to use with an AI system. The reason I bring this up, well, first of all, <laughs> it's new, it's interesting, it's um, something that will affect us in one way or another, um, same as the Creative Commons did. Um, there's an artist out there who, uh, who who released his work as an AI model. And um, that's noteworthy because a lot of the artists have been, well, at least a, a, a certain set of artists have been very loud about AI being bad, about this whole um, this whole copyright infringement thing. Um, and then there's DG Spicer. DG Spicer is an artist um, who trained an AI model that supports his own art styles. And if you look at this stuff, I mean, there's there's different kinds of uh, styles that he uses. Um, there's painterly style, there's an outline style, there's a landscape style, there's an anime style, and uh, 
uh, background style. Like he, he's working for, um, he's a game developer, he's a music composer, he's a digital artist. Um, and he, um, yeah, he has been working on AI related stuff for a couple of years now, especially for like, he used that for colorizing old black and white footage. And um, he's, he's, he's Dell. <laughs> he, he's, he, he went head first into all the AI stuff when it became a bit more um, visible in the, at least in the technical community. But also um, he specifically writes in an article that he put on Reddit um, that he's used this, um, used AI mainly as an assistant, assisting tool for extending his own creativity. And uh, he, 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 and, and I'm, I'm with him there. He's very clear about that this, that humans will be the leading role during the creative process, as usual. That will not change. And I, uh, the more I look into it, I say, yep, that's the real creativity is still a human thing. And it will take a long time for the AI to become really creative. It can do awesome things, but it's the real creativity is still a very human trait. And um, so he's using that and he's, uh, he's freely given away his art styles. So you can use them under a rail and under, under an open rail M license. And uh, you can use all his artworks as a data set. He's open with that too. So you can do your own training on things, but he's also given away that pre-trained model that can recreate his art style. And uh, I found this very noteworthy. So DJ Spicer, a uh, DG Spicer, um, check him out. Link is in the show notes. All right. I have to ask you a favor or a favor of you. Um, this is related to this very show here. You've received tips from the top floor, or some of you have received it for over 17 years. And um, tips from the top floor has been on the iTunes directory for all this time. It's been on several other directories, and it has accumulated like a 4.8 star rating on the iTunes directory during that time. Thank you for that, by the way. This is you who did that. And iTunes is still the most important directory for finding podcasts. If you do a search in your podcast client, chances are that the search results come directly from the iTunes directory. The one thing that you <laughs> that you didn't know and that has bothered me for a while is that several years ago, iTunes changed that underlying infrastructure, like the whole database system, whatever they run the directory on, that changed. Um, looked like they rebuilt it, but they didn't move all the shows over. And um, and as tips from the top floor, it's one of the oldest podcasts in that directory. It was like like a legacy podcast, so to speak. Uh, that means that for uh, quite a few years now, tips from the top floor has stayed on that legacy system together with a whole bunch of other podcasts, and it was not moved over to this new system. You didn't notice that, right? This this is something that was very transparent for you. You just kept getting the podcast but uh um not being on that new system was a bit of a disadvantage for for this little podcast here now a couple of weeks ago i could finally move the podcast over to the new system so uh, that's a good thing um it also means that the the the, the podcast still has its 4.8 star rating but the reviews are not available anymore i don't think they've been moved over so um, there's a, here's the favor I'm asking from you. If you could use Apple podcasts, if you use Apple podcasts, um, I'd be very, very happy if you could leave a review or give it a rating on there. Um, cause that'll help bring it, bring the show up in the search results, uh, especially nowadays as, as the podcast landscape has changed quite a bit. So what, what you do is open Apple podcasts, uh, on your smartphone on your mac um search for or any other platform that you're on for that matter but you search for photography tips from the top floor that's the official name photography tips from the top floor and submit a rating or a review or both and that would be really helpful thank you very much I'm
And that was it for today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for leaving a review or a rating wherever you get your podcasts. You're awesome. As always, you can leave feedback for the show directly here at tfttf.com slash hi. That's tfttf.com slash hi. And Chris has just done that. The other Chris writes, Hey Chris, long time listener, first time emailer. I just wanted to pass on a note of thanks for your AI and photography discussions recently. It's been a real eye opener for me. I tried Astria and was amazed to find it actually created some portraits of myself that I wish I had taken, which got me thinking about what is a portrait and could an AI image be entered in a portrait competition? So anyway, long story short, I ended up taking a portrait on that theme and writing a blog about it. Um, I'd love to hear thoughts. Cheers, Chris. So, um, Chris, thank you so much. This is this is ex this is an exciting little project. So, um, what Chris did is he had the AI generate a bunch of portraits of himself, thing pictures that came from the AI, and then he uh, printed them out and uh, photographed himself with these pictures. And uh, yeah. I, and I like it. I like the results. Um, and I do like the, the, the last result on your blog post, the one where you kind of hide your face behind your hand. And uh, so it's it's one of these... Um, well, you look at the pictures, you look at that one portrait with the four generated ones and yourself in the middle, you, you're the real you holding a hand in front of your face, I think just tells a bit of a deeper story than the others um, so yeah good job good job um, and again I I urge everyone out there as I have done for several episodes now to check out these AI generators just to get your feet wet just to start finding your way around these new technologies because sooner or later we'll all use them in one way or another Anyway, if you want to leave feedback for the show, you can do that at tfttf.com slash hi, tfttf.com slash hi. Also, thanks to all of you who support the show on Patreon. Patreon is a small but, but very welcome source of income for me, and uh, you can start supporting me at $1 per episode. Thanks all for supporting creators. Thanks uh, to you who are already doing that can find out more at tfttf.com slash support. Oh, and if you support the show on Patreon, you'll also be among the first to get to listen to it. The public release is always after the Patreon release. And last but not least, a quick reminder, you can join us for the Eastern European Photo Road Trip in September of this year. We'll set off from the vibrant city of Berlin in Germany and embark on an epic 10-day adventure through some of the most breathtaking destinations in Eastern Europe, from the charming streets of Prague to the elegant architecture of Vienna, the rich history of Budapest and the captivating landscapes and history of Transylvania. This will be a trip to remember. Pack your bags, get ready for a unique experience filled with great memories where you can capture the beauty and rich history and culture of Eastern Europe through your lens. Learn more at discoverthetopfloor.com. Oh, oh, oh and, if, and if you've been to one of my past photo tours, I might have a little something special for you regarding the Eastern European photo road trip. Just hit me up. And now, go out and take amazing photos. Be extra nice to each other. And of course, happy shooting. <laughs>